Hello and welcome to this latest episode of Embedded Finance Unplugged, the podcast series from Andaria that is exploring the world of embedded finance, the disruptive fintech sector on course to reach a multi-billion value over the next decade. I'm your host, Graham Barrett. On the previous episode, we looked at the technology platform that underpins embedded finance. Today, we're going to look at AML, anti-money laundering, and the challenges that this brings to a startup like Andaria working in the embedded finance space. And to this end, I'm delighted to introduce Claire Ferrugia, Chief Compliance Officer at Andaria. Claire, great to have you on the show. Delighted to be here, Graham. Thank you for the invitation. No, I really appreciate you taking the time. So... Let's just start, if you don't mind, by could you explain what anti-money laundering entails and why it's crucial in today's financial landscape? Well, anti-money laundering is the fight against financial crime. So um, uh, in within the financial services uh, industries, be it banking, being uh, financial institutions, insurance, what, what have you, um, there is always the fight to stop. Um, money from being laundered or the facilitation of money from being laundered through our institution. So um, uh, it's uh, it's quite a hot topic. Um, uh, it's been around for um, a, a long time, for a good number of years. And uh, the, uh, the aim of the uh, AML CFT regimes is there to combat um, fr- uh, dirty money from being laundered and integrated into the financial systems. So um, uh, it's, it's important for us to make sure that our um, uh, controls, our um, uh, uh, our processes in place are appropriate to fight off against money laundering and even terrorist financing because both of them are included in the same um, uh, in, in the same um, sort of bracket, so to speak, even though they both carry different typologies um, uh, when when you see it happening in in real life really. So what are your chief areas of responsibility then? As I said at the start, you're chief compliance officer, but really you're focused around AML, aren't you? That's your kind of core objective um, at the company. Yes, so I'm both uh, Chief Compliance Officer and AM and MLRO at Andaria. And I've been here now for two and a half years, which doesn't seem very long. But when it's a startup company, it's uh, basically uh, sometimes feels like a lifetime. Yeah, a lot can change in that time, can't it? Yeah. <laughs> yes, there were ups and downs, obviously, but overall it's been a very exciting experience. And I'm responsible for um, uh, both the compliance function and the AML function with my main focus at the moment being the AML CFT function. And uh, my my role is to make sure that in our internal policies and procedures, we have the right controls in place to mitigate the risks that come about from AML, CFT, um, and anything that we do, really. So it's not just... Um, our products and services, it's, we take into account geographical risk, product risk, um, anything that um, uh, comes about when a new product is launched or when our customer is offering a new product, we we have to mitigate the factors that create exposure for us from an AML CFT perspective. So um, there are challenges, obviously. Um, I think we'll talk about them a bit later in the in, in the in this session um but um it's uh, it, the regulation is always becoming more stringent um it's it's also a matter of balancing between what the regulator wants and what you can practically do within your business to satisfy the regulator and at the same time provide the best customer journey possible yeah it's that balancing act isn't it well, well let's dive into some of those challenges straight away because that's what I find really fascinating here. So what are the key challenges that Andaria faces as a startup? As you said, you've only been there two and a half years, but I'm sure even in that short space of time, the landscape has changed quite dramatically. So what are the challenges and, and how do you deal with them? 
one of the main challenges is obviously providing uh, an onboarding process for new customers, which is uh, compliant with the regulation and the requirements, and at the same time provides the customer with a seamless and uh, agile journey, and at the same time providing the best customer service possible. Now, in order to do that, um, uh, there are a, a number of challenges that uh, we need to overcome, which is basically um, how do we collect all the documentation we need, um, how do we make all the checks that we need to do in a short period of time that will give us uh, the ability to go back to the customer and onboard them in a seamless and pretty much um, short uh, journey. Um, that's one of the main challenges. Um, another challenge that comes across with AML CFD is mostly also around transaction monitoring. So once you get an, a customer onboarded, you need to make sure that it is behaving in the way that f um, the purpose of the relationship has been set up and it is, it is behaving in accordance to what was stated within the purpose of the relationship of the customer. Um, uh, in most cases, these things don't normally happen as, um, uh, as uh, uh, you know, as swimmingly as we would like them to. Um, but it's that is why implementing a, a robust transaction monitoring system is important. But the biggest challenge there is how to make um, a transaction monitoring system that is. Um, appropriate for the regulator and that it satisfies what the regulator wants to see within your business operations but at the same time also capturing what we need to what we need to see from the transactions that we are receiving from our customers and of course detecting any type of money laundering or terrorist financing it's it's easier said than done. Most uh, most uh, uh, behaviors, um, uh, uh, there are typologies we follow, but most behaviors will uh, will come come over in time. So um, patterns do not develop in within a week. It takes months to uh, to really identify that there is something untoward going on within a specific customer's activity. So those, I would say, are the main two challenges when it comes to AML. Brilliant. I'll come back to laws and regulations in a moment, but what I would first like to ask you is, what are some of the red flags of potential money laundering activities? How easy is it to spot when something untoward is happening? Uh, as I mentioned, there are typologies, but there are also patterns that you figure out once a customer starts um, transacting. During the onboarding, in most cases, you'd get the documents that you need, um, you'd get the communication that you need from the customer, and at that stage, um, there is rarely any suspicion that is raised unless a customer um, decides that they do not want to provide the information that you have requested for the onboarding to actually take place. So that in itself is a suspicious behavior. Um, but on the transactional side, um, you start seeing spikes in volumes when uh, the customer has said during the onboarding process that they would only be processing a certain amount of volume per month. And you see that on, in reality, um, it's double or even triple that amount. So that's a case where it's called a trigger event and we need to check why this is happening. And in, in most cases, there are even grounds for reporting suspicious activity to, to myself as the MLRO via internal reporting and also external reporting to, to the relevant authorities, um, given that I work as a group MLRO for, for the um, Andaria group. Um, you see patterns of transactions that, um, for instance, 
similar transactions being processed um, in one go, like 10 transactions of 500 euro each, just making an example here, um, which will automatically cause um, grounds for suspicion and as to why these transactions are taking place, which would require then an investigation by my team on the AML side to ensure that if there are grounds for suspicion of money laundering, we do, do we do that uh, um, in the least amount of time possible. Yeah, no, it sounds like a, a very robust procedure that you have there. And I guess it's down to your experience as an individual as well that you can spot these signs. Let's go back to the laws and regulations, because I imagine, but you tell me, that these laws and regulations are being updated and are changing all the time. How do you keep abreast of all the, the latest laws and regulations? Well, um, uh, it keeping abreast with with lots and regulations is not always easy because you 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 tend to get updates um uh, pretty much on a weekly monthly basis but there are ways and means um in terms of conferences that are held by the authorities locally here and in the UK as well and also um the FIAU uh, in Malta tends to deliver quite a few training sessions and coincidentally, I will be attending one in the beginning of April with respect to um, the regulatory changes that are coming up in uh, in the AML sphere. We also have a new authority that will be coming into play at, on, at the EU level, which is called the AMLA, the AML uh, authority that will be taking over um, uh, the, uh, all the regulatory and uh, uh, reports reporting for AML across the whole of the EU. So things are changing quite quickly. We have uh, rule books for compliance officers and MLROs as well. Uh, we also need to be approved by uh, the regulators in order to be able to perform our jobs prior to even starting doing the job. So there are quite a few controls in place um, that help us to keep aligned with the regulation, uh, mostly through updates from the regulators themselves and through conferences that are made available um, uh, by uh, different regulatory bodies or even audit firms locally that provide insight into this regulation. And uh, then there is the element of control from the regulators themselves through supervisory visits and audits that they come and uh, check um, on a periodic basis. Yeah. Now, controls, measures, audits are all very well, aren't they? And they are crucial to the running of the business, as you've just outlined. But how do you ensure that your AML initiatives don't stall the business objectives of the company? Well, um, it's part of an AML strategy that I have built. So whereas with payment services, the, the rules and regulations um, tend to come out with fresh uh, laws on a quite a frequent basis. Um, the AML regulation is based on the AML directives issued by the EU. And to some extent, even the UK tends to follow these EU directives, uh, simply because it's, it's much better to be aligned with what is happening within the EU um, uh, and the UK itself, it's given that even though Brexit has taken place, um, a harmonised approach is still one which creates less conflict. So it, the AML directives are updated from year to year. Um, we're now at the sixth AML directive and uh, it's, it's a question of making um, uh, the rules work for you, not the other way around. So my strategy is to ensure that each requirement of the um, uh, of the regulations that we have in place is in, indeed in effect within our processes, but around that we can create a process that is agile and that is um, uh, 
but which is not counterproductive to what we aim to achieve. So we need to make sure that our processes are also business friendly, and uh, um, and through that we make sure that we follow the rules, get the necessary checks that we need, employ third party tools to help us automate as much as possible what we can and can't do, and uh, after that we can, we are able to to do a quick turn around on on the checks that we do and then obviously back things up with policies and procedures great now in any sector ai is a huge talking point isn't it and i'm sure that's no different in embedded finance but specifically related to aml how do you see ai and machine learning changing the landscape of aml I would see it primarily taking part in the transaction monitoring process, really, the way we manage our queues for um, uh, dealing with the transaction monitoring alerts that we receive from transactions that have been processed by our customers. Um, uh, the the way that rules can become smarter through AI and the uh, the the way that AI can also learn the historic activity of our customers and start generating alerts that would minimize the false positive element uh, in the system, which is where false positive is something that we have to deal with on a daily basis. But AI would be able to learn the um, the historic uh, behavior of our customers and generate alerts that make more sense and would generate um, uh, actual um, alerts that we can investigate accordingly. So I think AI for me is mostly um, relevant to uh, to transaction monitoring from, from an AML standpoint, that is. And on the flip side, are you concerned that the people trying to perpetrate money laundering, if they start using sophisticated AI tools, it will become harder to, to detect. Is that a concern at all? Yes, that's always a risk, eh? because um, uh, with AI, um, you have people who use it for the right reasons and people who use it for the wrong reasons. And uh, AI can be used to learn um, our processes, the way we monitor transactions, our limits that we imposed. And uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we We can have customers that... Are, realize what our limits are in terms of um, where a transaction gets um, alerted and and blocked temporarily before it is being reviewed by the team and then released accordingly. Um, they can transfer uh, funds that um, uh, or split funds into uh, values that do not hit those um, those values, and they would go through without any problems so yes i think it can it, it is a concern that ai can can be used in the wrong hands obviously and as a follow up to that as we're looking into the future and what the future might hold what are going to be your key areas of focus over the next year and even beyond that as well well um quite a few things actually um First of all, sure. <laughs> yes, you know, being in a uh, in a senior management position, I'm able to set the strategy for the AML team and to a certain extent also for the compliance side of the business. Um, uh, so I am able to make sure that the strategy focuses primarily on um, moving forward with the business, with with any product that it wishes to launch. Now, the the next the next product that Andaria will be going into is embedded finance, and we've already started working with the embedded finance piece. So for me, it's a matter of making sure we have the right onboarding process in place, because at this time we don't, we're not looking only at corporate customers; we're looking at the B two B to C. Um, uh, 
uh, aspect of onboarding. So we need to cater not just for corporates, but for um, uh, for consumers as well. So how do we do that efficiently? We have to provide a seamless onboarding process for users who then who then will be also able to apply for a card but, um, issued by Andaria as well. Um, and for corporates, we try to, as much as possible, give a more personalized uh, um, uh, interaction, communication, to ensure that the process is swifter and we also um, get the transparency we need from the customers to ensure that we are onboarding within what we require from a regulatory perspective, but also from a business sense, we make sure that it also works in providing an agile and a streamlined approach. For me, that was one of the main objectives with the strategy I've built for, for um, the AML side of things. And then, of course, improving our uh, internal tools to make them as agile as our onboarding process. We don't want to get stuck with alerts for transaction monitoring when um, we want to be able to process multiple transactions at a time. It's a waste of human resource and it's a waste of time um, uh, However, so we want to have the best tools in place, which is why we're looking for optimization of tools. And this is something that I've been working on for, well, ever since I've joined, really, in, in a sense where um, we try to optimize as much as we can the tools we have to make it more agile and um, uh, consistent with the business growth. Yeah, and I see what you mean when you add in the B2B to C, that adds an extra level of complexity, doesn't it, when we're talking about the embedded finance space. So, but listen, it sounds like you have it completely under control. So I just want to say, Claire Ferrugia, thank you very much for taking me through AML and Daria, and uh, that's been very helpful. So thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. There are plenty more conversations to explore as part of this Embedded Finance podcast series. Please like, follow or subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do give us a positive rating and review. You can find out more about how Andaria is broadening access to digital financial services for businesses all around the globe at andaria.com. But for now, thanks for listening and goodbye.